and we're live. Welcome back to another exciting episode. Emphasis on the exciting of Professor and the Idiot. I'm Nick Wolfinger. I'm Amy Newberg. I'm the Idiot. You're not really the Idiot. It's... I'm... <laughs> but... <laughs> and I end up having a discussion every time as to whether or not I'm an Idiot. That's okay. There's much to be said for being self-effacing. Right. <laughs> if not self-negating. And so today we are here with Tom Maloney. Tom's a professor of economics at the University of Utah, where he's taught for over 25 years, so just a little longer than me. He was department chair for six years. He studies U.S. economic history, demography, labor economics, among other things. He's looked at the economics of African Americans in the 20th century, immigration, and a whole bunch of other stuff that I'm not going to read off the list. And so, <laughs> hey, Tom. I so, you found my webpage. Good. <laughs> I have a browser. So yeah. we wanted to talk to Tom to talk about uh, the economy in 2020 in historical perspective. Uh, we've just spent a huge amount of money on a bailout, and we have questions. Do you want to start, Amy? Sure. Um, you know, I, I guess I got really intrigued by the whole concept of the deficit because suddenly, out of the blue, in a very short amount of time and rather easily, it seems, we came up with $3 trillion to, to bail out the COVID economy. And this just got me really wondering a lot of general questions about the deficit, like what what is it? What form does it take? To whom do we owe the money? Uh, well, let's just start with that. To who, what is the deficit? Who do we owe the money to? So the, the deficit is, you know, I guess in, in the simplest terms, it's just sort of the sort of excess of federal spending over federal revenues, you know, the, the flow of that uh, ac across a fiscal year. And so you, you know, you want to distinguish between deficit and debt. Debt will be the accumulation of those deficits, you know, as long as they are not paid off over time. So, um, so the, yeah, so the deficit for the federal government is sort of like it would be for any entity, just that shortfall of uh, revenues versus spending. Um, the deficits that we're running now are uh, are quite large, uh, that's for sure. And um, uh, in terms of sort of who who do we owe the money to, mainly we owe it mainly we owe it to ourselves. Um, the uh, the sort of formal mechanisms kind of behind the issuing of debt will typically involve the federal government selling, you know, securities of some kind uh, that people will uh, have a claim on. And and currently about um, you know, almost two thirds of that is held domestically. That is, it's held by people. Um, who, uh, you know, who live in the U.S. So um, to some degree, uh, as some folks emphasize, uh, a federal deficit is in some sense, um, uh, you know, analogous to a private surplus. That is, people, you know, people in the private sector are, are kind of uh, typically holding uh, claims on that, on that deficit. It's also the case that um, some of that uh, debt will be simply held by the central bank, will be held by the Federal Reserve. And this is kind of, I think, you know, probably what's behind this ability to so nimbly um, expand the deficit quickly. The federal government can um, issue debt instruments. The Federal Reserve uh, will buy them. And in, so in some sense, you know, that mechanism is, is just sort of generating uh, new spending power pretty straightforwardly. So, uh, so if I, as a citizen, have some sort of investment in the deficit, what is, what is, oh, yeah. the, what is the item that I am involved in? I mean, is it a bond? What, what well, it's a, it's, a, it's a bond or a security of some kind that says, you know, uh, you have a claim uh, on this amount of money, um, you know, at some, at some future date. It may generate uh, a flow over time as well. Probably if you looked in um, your uh, sort of institutionally held uh, retirement account, if I looked in my TIA CREF uh, portfolio, there'd be a lot of um, government securities in there. So um, it's, it's um, th there are a variety of kinds of them, but that's, you know, that's basically what it is. So here's one thought that I had. Uh, here, I'll tell it as a, a as a uh, parable. 
So back in March, when the stock market was cratering, I thought, wow, stock's really cheap. I should buy some stock using whatever cash I had in my bank account. And then I thought, wait a moment, stock is cratering. It may not be up for a while. I don't have cash to buy. I should save my cash just in case I need it. So mm -hmm. who, when the economy craters and the government spends a lot of money and f pays for it with debt, who is then inclined to buy our debt? Well, you know, government, uh, government securities are, are pretty safe. I mean, that's, right. you know, that's sort of the appeal of them is that you, if you, if you buy them, um, they're, you know, the government is not going to face a bill that it can't pay. Right. Amount, right. So, um, so it doesn't sort of have this, the same sort of uh, risk concerns that buying other, you know, kind of private equities or stocks might carry. Uh, and so in fact, you know, I think um, I, I'm a totally, totally passive uh, investor myself, but um, you know, I think typically when returns on stocks are down, people shift uh, more of what they're buying into, um, into these other kinds of um, uh, safer bonds. And so, um, so you don't, you know, at a time when the, when the stock market is cratering, that's actually a time when I would expect uh, institutions and individuals to um, to be more attracted to holding um, to holding government securities. Again, because they're you know especially federal securities, there's no sense in which uh, they're they're not going to be paid. I think I understand then. So just okay, so yeah, that's counterintuitive to me because the deficit keeps getting higher and higher and higher, which says to me that we are not paying people back. Right. Well, it, it says that we're borrowing more rapidly than uh, than we're paying back. And again, you know, you know, a, a non-trivial portion of this, about um, thirteen or fifteen percent now, is just held by the Federal Reserve. Um, and so, uh, it, it, and, and so that, and again, that's kind of how the, the most rapid and and, um, and sort of nimble uh, expansion of this, this spending power is going to occur. Um, but. But um, you know the bonds are not defaulted on. I mean, the federal government uh, can can always sort of cover these um, cover these debts that it owes. So um, it's not that it's not that people aren't sort of being repaid something that they're owed. It's that uh, it, that the sort of rate of, of issuing new debt is exceeding the rate which it's being paid off. Which you know um, is is certainly what's going on at this point. I, I mean, it's not the case that. The deficits and the debt are always expanding, or at least not, uh, you know, relative to the size of the economy. I mean, one kind of historical perspective that I think is worthwhile to keep in mind is that, um, kind of coming out of the Second World War, if you looked at the ratio of the federal debt to um, to the size of the economy, so the debt to GDP ratio, that was around 125 percent. That is, there was about a uh, dollar twenty-five in federal debt for every dollar of sort of um, uh, economic value flowing through the economy in a year. Um, that number actually fell to uh, around 40% by the end of the 1970s um, and then began to rise again in the mid 1980s, fell a little bit uh, in the Clinton years. You may remember we had, you know, arguably um, surpluses briefly in that uh, period. Right at, the, right at the turn of the century, if I remember. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, and, then, and then rose again, rose about 15, 20 points under George W. Bush. You remember there was a, uh, the sort of dot-com uh, contraction yeah. uh, right around the turn of the century. And then there was a you know, very large expansion of, of debt relative to GDP uh, during the financial crisis, which got us up to about 100%. Uh, that is to say, a debt that was about the size of the, uh, the sort of annual GDP flow. And now we're at about 107 or something like that. Uh, my sense is that this isn't a problem because people are still willing to buy our bonds. And is that correct? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, and I'm going to speak... Uh, you know, is not primarily a macroeconomist here, but I think that's I think that's right. I mean, and, and some folks would go even a little bit further. Some would say, well, as, you know, as long as the Fed is willing to buy our bonds, which is to say, always, um, it's not a problem. And, and this actually um, kind of uh, kind of leads to um, you know some discussion of what has become a sort of a a, a popular 
a new sort of view of these issues, which is called modern monetary theory. Oh, yes. So I'm not going to try to, <laughs> uh, to sound too expert on, but there was a, a, a new book that came out just yesterday um, called The Deficit Myth, uh, Modern Monetary Theory and the Birth of the People's Economy by Stephanie Kelton. Stephanie Kelton, who um, uh, has been working on this for a while, other people work on it too, but she's sort of the, become the, the primary spokesperson for this view. Um, and, and, and her view is that uh, the debt sort of never, more or less never matters. Um, it's not the debt um, uh, itself that we should uh, really typically be concerned about because again, in some sense, uh, in their view, it's, it's impossible for the federal government to sort of default on what, uh, on what it owes. And so um, what we wanna have in mind as a target for federal spending and for, um, and, for the, and for the deficit and the debt is um, aiming for a level of demand that is sufficient to keep the economy fully employed. That the constraint is not on sort of the monetary side, but it's on the sort of real economy side. And in the condition as we're in today, when we have, you know, at least, I'm sure, uh, 15% unemployment, it's probably, um, you know, really in some sense a little bit higher than that. Uh, you've got a lot of idle um, resources. And so you've got a lot of room to, uh, to run deficits and inject demand into the economy um, without, uh, without worrying about straining the kind of real constraints um, which are really the only thing, according to, to modern monetary folks, um, that you need to be concerned about. Amy, do you want to take the next question? Well, so regarding this most recent influx of money into this into society, um, which happened so quickly and easily that it would just really surprised us mm -hmm. um, and and made me wonder if it was so quick quick and easy to just sort of grab three trillion dollars out of our butts within a matter of days mm -hmm. um, and hand out these you know hand out sort of massive unemployment and these little twelve hundred dollar checks to people. Um, for, well, first of all, how was that done so quickly? Like, what were the mechanisms of it being done so quickly? And if it was that easy, then why did we wait until now to solve the economic problems of this country? I mean, why couldn't we just reach in there anytime and pull out $3 trillion and solve problems like, like proper health care and better education for under-resourced people and and you know, property assistance for, you know, people who have trouble acquiring property or any number of things that would boost our, our, our success as a country and our productivity and our employment and, you know, our level of education and make, make America just like great better. again, <laughs> great, again. you know, yeah. <laughs> like what, you know, what the hell is, yeah. what, the hell? what, the, what hell? the hell indeed. Um, <laughs> Well, in terms of kind of the specific mechanisms, I'm not sure that I can um, that I can sort of uh, uh, give too much of a timeline there. Again, you know, the basic idea is that um, that government debt is easy to issue, uh, that the Fed uh, will uh, buy it sort of even more mechanically. Basically, all we're talking about is a sort of um, balances being added to people's uh, to people's accounts through these checks. It's really it, it's it's not. Um, you know, there, there's sort of formalities behind it, but it's not much more complicated than that. You know, how, um, um, why haven't we done this before to solve our problems? Well, one answer to that, I think, is that this is certainly not a universal view of how this works. I mean, people people do, uh, other, other folks, and certainly a large number of other folks, do have concerns about how much of this kind of um, deficit spending you can do. And, and, and historically, those concerns have, been uh, have revolved around a few things. One is the notion that if the government is issuing debt, um, it's competing with private debt issuers. So if I'm lending money to the federal government, then there's less money for me to lend to, you know, somebody who's starting up a business, and so borrowing becomes more expensive. Um, you know, what is called crowding out. Um, that's one concern. Um, there are concerns about inflation that that other people. Uh, think are sort of more immediate than than do these sort of modern monetary theory folks uh, who do have concerns about that, but but um, but sort of less immediately, I guess I'd say. And then there are, you know there are concerns about about sort of intergenerational equity. I mean, you certainly hear this rhetoric of the notion that 
we're burdening our grandchildren with this. Um, so, so again, not everyone, uh, and certainly not everyone uh, who uh, is in Congress has adopted this view. Um, and not, not, not nearly, you know, every macroeconomist has adopted this view. I'm not sure that many have, but it's, it's growing uh, in, uh, in persuasiveness. I think generally, it seems to me that, that macroeconomists across the board maybe that's too strong, but um, a broad sweep of them have become less concerned about deficits, even if they don't buy this whole package. Um, they believe that sort of the, the limits of what we can do safely are probably further out than we realized. And um, why don't we just do this all the time and spend all this money? Well, again, there's this, the fact that not everybody's persuaded about this. There's the political problem. Right. That, um, folks in Congress uh, aren't persuaded. Um, and there's also the question about what you spend the money on and whether, whether you can do it effectively, right? I mean, um, this, this, in this particular moment, I think we're spending a lot of money to try to um, inject demand into the economy, but I think also simply to try to alleviate, to alleviate suffering in some sense. I mean, a lot of people uh, were, were put in a very, uh, a very difficult position all at once. Um, and so, if folks are using this to you know, pay their rent or um, pay a medical bill, um, I, think, I think that's uh, uh, that's kind of the intended purpose at this point. But again, so what you spend the money on and whether it's, it's effective in, in sort of accomplishing the goals that you, that you want is um, sort of another piece of that question. But, and just I'm rambling here, but um, to kind of um, tie that together, I mean, the folks who, who, who take this view of how the macro economy works are also likely to take the view that we can afford to do job guarantees or that we can afford to do um, some kind of universal basic income or something along those lines. And so people who, who make this argument would certainly say, you know, we could be doing more of this um, than we historically have. Uh, so I, you know, just read a little about modern uh, monetary theory, and while, <laughs> while I certainly would support more deficit spending at the moment, uh, modern uh, monetary theory seemed improbable to me just because it seemed like uh, blood from a stone. Like there are no constraints. Yeah, there are no constraints. Yeah. And it if we kept on engaging in deficit spending, wouldn't interest rates have to go up eventually? Well, um, it's a good question. Um, I don't know uh, kind of what the most effective response to that is, but I would say that um, we've been living with interest rates that are you know, quite low for a long time. Um, you know, or arguably real rates that uh, in some cases are negative at times. Um, the case that is often brought up in these discussions is the case of Japan which has a debt to GDP ratio more than twice as large as ours, more than twice as large as ours was at the end of 2019, so around 240%. So they have about um, you know, two and a half times as much debt as they do sort of annual flow uh, of GDP. And they uh, at the same time have had you know, inflation and interest rates that are just very, very low for a long time. So, so whatever, those, whatever those boundaries might be, it doesn't seem that we're uh, that we're effectively near them at this point. But um, hasn't Japan also had sluggish income growth and indeed yeah. deflation for a long time? It's had, yeah, it certainly had, it hasn't had sort of, uh, yeah, rapid um, um, rapid growth for a long while either. And it's kind of how, how you see the causality there. There's a good question, the sort of demographic issues that play into that too, of course. Right. Um, but um, But minimally, you know, I think you can say you can, you can run big deficits and carry a lot of debt without bumping up against um, inflation and rising interest rates. I mean, that kind of goes to the, maybe a, uh, an additional point here, which is that, you know, in this view, it's really, it's sort of, um, it's demand that matters. And if demand has not sort of um, picked up to a point that's gonna um, put pressure on those, on prices, you know, then, then, then it's not a concern. I, I just have a quick, idiot tangential question. Um, what is macroeconomics? That is an outstanding question. Um, what is macroeconomics? Um, I'm not going to try to give you a, 
Webster defines, I'm not going to give you a um, textbook definition, but I, but I guess the distinction that I have in my head is that macroeconomics typically thinks in terms of aggregates and the performance of um, states or nation states um, and policies that are that are relevant to the kind of uh, that level of performance. So unemployment, um, you know, the unemployment rate, the um, notion of business cycles, uh, inflation, growth, um, those are those are generally macroeconomic questions. Microeconomic questions are generally more about the behavior of individuals. So um, you know, under what condition, under what circumstances should I invest in more education? Um, you know, under what conditions should I, uh, should I buy this good or that good? So the, the unit of, of decision-making that you're thinking about is as an individual or maybe a household. Um, and, and without sort of getting too far afield again from my own expertise, if, if you, I think sort of one thing that's happened over time is that, um, those things have, um, have merged a little bit and people have sort of tried to build their macroeconomic models out of, um, out of microeconomic structures. Um, basically to say, let's treat, let's treat the economy as sort of an aggregate representative agent and we'll just think about it as a person. I, um, and, Tom, I uh, think that was a really good answer. I just wanted to let you know. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I, uh, I mean, I think that, you know, things have sort of kind of one piece of evidence that things have moved in that direction is increasingly you know, there are business schools, for instance, that don't require their students to study macro at all, hmm. um, because the notion is, you know, everything is basically individual level decision making added up. Um, people who still take macro seriously, you know, think that it sort of, you know, sort of matters who the people are, um, that, um, um, that there are uh, ways in which, um, you know, I, I suppose power relationships and political relationships and um, and other sorts of things that you can't model at the level of individual, um, you know, that those things still matter. And so, um, and so that's kind of a distinction, I guess. So how do you feel about, about this latest distribution of money? Do you think it was the right thing to do? You know, it's a, it's a great question. I guess I do. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I don't, nobody's waiting on me to pronounce, <laughs> you know, what, about, about modern monetary theory. Uh, but, I, but I am sort of of the view that we can probably do more along these lines than we historically have in terms of income support and deficit spending. Um, you know, I, th I think, um, the, you know, the argument that, uh, you know, my family has to balance our budget, so, so should the federal government, uh, is, not a, is not really a very persuasive argument. The federal government's a very different thing. It issues its own currency. So... <laughs> so I, I, I think that uh, I think that we can we can do this, right? I think that we can provide more of this kind of support. I think also <laughs> I'm laughing because yet my family also cannot issue debt at low interest rates to fund itself. Exactly. Work in mind, correct? Wait, wait, uh, wait, what? You mean those Maloney bonds I bought are useless? <laughs> you should. You should flush those right down the toilet, man. Okay. Not anything on that. <laughs> okay. But, uh, yeah. So you know. So I think that I, I think that that there have been um, I think not very well developed arguments made to sort of constrain what the federal government does. So yeah, I mean, I think that I think that you need um, it's good to sort of um, provide support to people who are uh, suffering in in, um, in very challenging times, um, and, and I think that we can manage it. Um, I'm, I'm persuaded by that. It's interesting to think about what this will mean in the long run. I mean, one of the sort of uh, historical dimensions of this is sort of the way that the federal government's role in the economy evolves through crises. And, and it's, so it's very historically dependent, right? It's not like anybody really sits down and sort of says, you know, in the, uh, on day one, this is how we ought to do things. Um, it, it evolves through the crises that we face. And so the kind of the kind of income support and and other sorts of um, um, interventions of the federal government and the economy that we have largely, uh, you know, grew out of the New Deal and grew out of the Depression. Um, and so we got a certain set of policies that fit those circumstances. <clears throat> Once those things are in place, uh, typically even, it, you know, as that crisis fades, a lot of that stuff will remain in place. There's a guy named Robert Higgs who, uh, who wrote... Uh, 
a, a book and a series of papers kind of about this phenomenon. She called it kind of a crisis and ratchet effect. So we ratchet up uh, the federal presence in, in the economy during crises. And we don't, it doesn't come all the way back down um, when, um, when good times return. And so, so the, the policies that we get are formed uh, in a historically dependent way in crisis. So um, the fact that this is such a unique period uh, makes me sort of wonder um, what kind of persistent interventions might come through this. I mean, what, one actually, uh, one example of that is that in part of this expansion of unemployment uh, compensation, it's not just sort of the $600 um, additional, but um, allowing, for instance, um, sort of gig workers to, uh, to make um, claims on, an, on unemployment, right? Typically, yeah. somebody who's an independent contractor can't do that. Right on. I benefit from that. Yep. Yeah. So, so that's, so that seems to me to be something that we, that, that you, you know, it's sort of done in the, in the instance of the crisis, but that really, you know, makes, makes a heck of a lot of sense, at least to me, and maybe will be one of those things then that persists mm-hmm. in the long run coming out of this. But, um, yeah. so, you know, there's a lot to be said, uh, sort of about, for um, about that, I think about the historically dependent nature of these things. Right. Um, and then my, my final question on my list is just about how this compares to the rest of the world. You talked a little bit about Japan. Um, and I'd be curious to know if our, our system, the way, the way we work, our deficit system is similar around the world or do different countries have different ways of addressing this? Well, you know, I, I suppose in the specifics, there are going to be differences. And, and, and one, you know, one thing that's, that's really different is whether or not, uh, you know, the country um, is able to sort of do all its dealing in its own currency. So there are countries that um, where you might really transact a lot in U.S. dollars uh, and not in the not in the home currency, or in which the country uh, owes owes debt um, in U.S. dollars and not in its own currency. That's gonna um, you know that's gonna work out very differently, and they're gonna have a lot less uh, of this sort of discretion. Um, but um, but can you uh, say that again, Tom? I sorry. Well, I, I mean, I think I think that yeah. that uh, that and it kind of you know I'm going to sort of back away from the strong sort of MMT position here and kind of go back to your point earlier, Nick. That as long as people are willing to uh, to lend this government money, then you know then they can borrow as much as they want. But if if the government owes uh, has obligations that are not denominated in its own that are in its own currency, it's going to have to sort of buy other currencies um, to, to manage these things. Or if um, uh, if it can't find entities to um, to purchase its debt, then it's going to have less less discretion. Okay. So, um, so so not everyone can do it this way. Um, I mean, if you know, we, we talked about what uh, Japan looks like, um, the sort of eurozone recently debt to GDP sort of on the order of eighty four percent or so. UK 80% or so, those are going to be larger now. So they're sort of in the same ballpark uh, with regard to what the US has done. And so when you say debt denominated in other, other dollars, uh, did that mean when the purchasers of American debt are foreign nationals? I'm just trying to follow up on the thread where you said the purchasers of American debt, it, non Americans are purchasing a larger share of American debt. They're not actually purchasing a larger share. I'm not sure if I said if I said that I sort of didn't intend to say it. I mean, the, oh, the, the share that's held outside the U.S. is actually down trade. a bit, but um, has gone up a bit or gone down a bit. It's gone down a bit. Okay. Yeah, from from I think well a few points anyway. Does that have any relevance to our ability to borrow? That's I think what I'm getting at. Right, and and I think I think probably. Uh, Probably not uh, right now, at least okay. because a the the levels are uh, pretty low, and and uh, b the ability of the Fed to back the debt uh, is always present. So um, China currently holds, I guess, about uh, about seven percent of U.S. debt, and that's down a little bit uh, from prior years. Japan is the only other country that's sort of in that neighborhood. Uh actually uh, going to go off topic slightly and that is the 
uh, states like California and others that are passing laws governing gig workers. And part of me is glad knowing how gig workers get fucked over and have to pay a larger share of their their um, payroll taxes. But are there downsides here? Downsides to to treating gig workers um, to uh, sort of providing them more of the infrastructure that other, that other workers Yes. Have. I mean, will that put pressure? Will that put pressure on companies to fire their gig workers or give them fewer hours? Uh, well, I mean, I guess it may put some pressures on them, but yeah. what, what format takes, um, yeah. you know, sort of depends. I mean, it yeah. could put pressure on them to I can tell you what's something better and treat them better. Yeah. I mean, some Lyft drivers that I've spoken to back in the days when I was taking Lyft have said that it's really going to hurt them, actually. They're, um, they're, con they're concerned about what? Yeah, they're concerned that well, they're going to be hiring fewer drivers, um, not having as many on the road at the same time so that they can they can disperse their uh, if they're going to be having benefits, then then they can't pay as many drivers at the same time. Before you answer to Tom, let me interject something uh, there. And I'm wondering if there's truth to that or if that's just propaganda the Lyft company is feeding to their drivers to get them to oppose the bill that granted them. Uh, status as, as employees. So, so I think this this goes to. Um, I mean, I think we we could maybe discuss it in the kind of context of broader labor market policy. So the same argument is made about the minimum wage, right? right. Uh, there's always concern that if we raise the minimum wage, uh, teenagers will lose their jobs, or new workers won't have the opportunity to come into positions and gain skills and move up. Um, you know, it, it must be right. I mean, if, if you're going to make me pay more money uh, to labor, okay. uh, presuming that the market is competitive, I'm going to hire less labor. Right? Now that, so that I know is, I read enough to know isn't true. To see right, so all the, yeah, yeah. To see so all the, of, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but that's sort of where the, where the sort of standard market clearing model, you know, pushes you. And I, I'm, I'm sort of sensitive to this lately because I've been teaching intermediate micro theory, uh, which I haven't taught in a long time. Maybe never taught before. And, uh, and you know, in the models in the textbooks, Pretty much the models all point in that direction. And, and so then you sort of have to say to yourself and to the students, well, what, what's, what's assumed here in the background? The assumption is that, um, that, the, that the market is so competitive that these firms are making just barely enough for this to be worthwhile. And if we, <clears throat> if we raise what we're compensating, raise what we're giving to workers either through pay or benefits by you know, another dollar, then the return on Mr. Uber's investment uh, is going to be um, too low. He's going to pull out his money and go buy something else. Um, that's a very strong <laughs> set of assumptions. Yeah. Right? And so um, it also says, you know, that, that the demand for this thing, that the service that these workers are providing is very, very inelastic. So that if right. we, you know, raise the, the price of an Uber ride by a nickel, then no, no one's going to, no one's going to buy it. Yeah. Right. So, so, if, you know, I think in fact, demand for a lot of services is not that elastic, yeah. especially for fairly low price services. And I think in fact, the market is generally not so competitive that every firm is uh, operating on the, uh, on, the, on the razor's edge. Some I'm sure are, but um, you know, I, th I think that the empirical work and the contrast between the empirical work on the minimum wage and the theory of the minimum wage Suggest that there's something missing in the theory. The, the, the empirical work, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to overstate it. I mean, I don't want to say that yeah. you know, it's always zero. Yeah. Or even, you know, some people will find positive effects, yeah. which you can rationalize yeah. under a monopsony kind of model, right. which I can talk about if you want. But um, but it, if those effects, if those disemployment effects are there, they're pretty small. Let me tell you why I'm laughing. Uh, in my So the economist who I study family, marriage and divorce. Yeah. And the economist who's most relevant to that mm -hmm. is the Nobel laureate, Gary Becker. Sure. Who, you know, as you know, Tom, uh, and I'll tell you, Amy, wrote uh, a famous, but uh, won the Nobel Prize basically by writing a bunch of theoretical treatise on how the family should work. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, applying, applying mar uh, market theory to the family. Yeah. Now, the Problem is, 
it's all wrong. Whenever people started testing it with data, none of it was true. And yeah. so I love, uh, you know, I love when I peer review articles and there's sort of a, you know, almost by rote, it's sort of a tick, a reference to what Becker says. I said, why the fuck are we still citing this asshole who just made up a bunch of shit that isn't true? I mean, I could make up stories too. Sorry, I'm on a soapbox. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, once you've got that clean model, once you've got that, you know, upward sloping supply curve and that downward sloping demand curve and you've got an equilibrium point, you, you just sort of see it everywhere. And uh, right. you see it within the family. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's like i said yeah. you know when all you got is a hammer everything looks like yes a yes so, um you know i mean I, I, to be I, I suppose i mean part of what i find appealing yeah about economics and yeah. part, so you know when i when i was trying to figure out what i wanted to do in college yeah started out as a as a communication major actually i thought i was gonna be a journalist and that didn't go very far and i kind of you know i took a bunch of different social science classes and, and I did find the sort of, you know, the structure of the models in economics to be appealing. I do think that, that they give you a place to sort of put your foot to sort of start right. maybe asking questions, but you gotta, you gotta sort of recognize when it's distorting or when it's not working right. very well. Um, and just to, to kind of come back to the labor market part of it, I mean, yeah. um, but especially I think with regard to gig workers and with regard yeah. to other changes in the way labor markets work, kind of franchising and changes around that. I would just recommend to folks, my colleague, uh, Marshall Steinbaum, uh, has, with, co with co-authors, has written uh, on these issues. They've written some, some good stuff on monopsony power, which is to say, if there are few buyers for labor and not, you know, uh, not sort of infinitely many buyers of labor, then, um, then these things work out differently. So that work is interesting, I think. And then uh, there's a guy named Brian Kalachi, uh, who uh, did his PhD at UMass Amherst, who um, who writes on these things too, especially with regard to uh, sort of gig workers and franchise, uh, uh, the way franchises kind of affect the rights of labor, all of which I think is is pretty interesting. I mean, if you know, I mentioned that I would do some work on inequality, and I think, you know, uh, the, the sort of big picture of understanding inequality has to take into account um, the way that, that the, the uh, sort of legal rights of workers have evolved over time. Yeah. Um, and I think that relates obviously directly to this kind of Uber Lyft question. It's been an interesting challenge for artists um, because we are so accustomed to having one-off situations. You right. Go one place and you do one gig, another place you have another gig. Um, and there are some places that are saying, well, we can no longer support that because of this new law. And so we're going to either have to hire you or get rid of you completely. We'd hire you as an ongoing employee or get rid of you completely. And that's right. out, right. you know, not to be really practical to, to hire artists, you know, so they're just losing those jobs. Hmm. The, art, so, the, the artists are losing the jobs? I mean, this is the fear that this is what's going to happen. Wait, but it hasn't actually happened. It's just the fear? Um, it's unclear what's going to, I don't know what's happening now. I mean, I you know, there are still gigs and people doing gig work. Sure. Um, but there, there are also some establishments that are saying, now we're going to have to hire you so that we can give you benefits. And, huh. since we and what sort of work, like what sort of art are we talking about? Uh, gig, you know, music gigs. Amy okay. is a, but Amy is a musician. Okay. That's interesting because, you know, I, I think that's, a, you make a good point. I, I hadn't really thought about, um, the reach of these laws into that kind of space. I mean, I think part of the, part of the argument about, uh, in, in favor of doing this for situations like Uber and Lyft and other, you know, gig work of that type, where it's where it's not a you know it's not a one off, it's an ongoing relationship, but in, in which you know some would argue that um, you know these people have been defined as uh, sort of independent contractors um, in order to allow the company to avoid having to having to pay benefits or having to deal with, um, with other kinds of um, aspects of those long-term relationships, even though in every other way, the, um, the work has an employer-employee kind of feel to it. The company tells you, you know, um, kind of gives you very strict parameters about how the, how the work is to be done. Um, so, so, you know, I, I, I think there's a, at least in my head, there's a big distinction between being an Uber driver 
and doing and being a musician or an artist who's actually, you know, doing a one-off kind of thing. And it, it's, I don't know to what degree um, the law reaches into that second category, but, but in my mind, it's not what the, um, what the policy was meant to do. Yeah, I think it wasn't really well thought out in that regard. And um, I know that there are some exceptions for some kinds of artists or something like that, but then others who are apparently being screwed and there are various little groups that are suing, um, to, you know, to get them, like truckers I know are, are suing to get themselves exempted from this. Hmm. So yeah, it, it's, it's, it seems, it feels like it's not, it's, it's in flux that that whole law. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that it is. I mean, I, I think that I think that, that there will be things to be learned, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and particularly with regard to the way these conditions vary across different kinds of um, industries and sectors. So I had another question, um, a specific question about the uh, bailouts we just did. Mm. And that is, it seems like a lot of guaranteed loans are being offered to large companies that don't need the money. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, it's infuriating to think if 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 Google gets a bunch of uh, loans from the government and just uses it for stock buybacks, that would that would make me unhappy. Yeah. But I'm wondering if the, then I started thinking about it some more and I wonder if there's just some messaging going on. Is this just to tell credit markets that credit is available so the stock market has confidence? Is that is there some meta messaging going on just about uh, credit markets staying fairly liquid? That's a good point. I mean, I suppose, yeah, I mean, I mean, that I think that makes intuitive sense. I think there's also, you know, uh, a lot that goes into a lot of sort of power relationships that go into the construction of these kinds of spending bills. And so right. it could serve sort of both of those purposes at the same time, I suppose, uh, appeasing folks who, um, you know, who are important, uh, but also uh, kind of making this, this kind of backstop sort of signal. Um, I mean, it can do both those things at the same time. Are you on the same page as I am that the the amount paid to workers has just been wholly inadequate? Because if you're me, I don't need twelve hundred dollars, right? If I get that, I just put it in the bank. But if you are a you're a worker making closer to the median wage, maybe taking home a couple thousand dollars a month, and you've just been furloughed, that thousand yeah. that twelve hundred dollars isn't going to last you very long. So it's it's either too little or not enough. Yeah, what, what it, are, yeah, yeah. And wondering how it's either so wondering if there was a better way uh, our government should have proceeded. That's a good question. I mean, it is you know, I, it's hard for me to to sort of think about what. It's going to sound totally lacking lacking in empathy, but I'm an economist, so that's kind of part of the course. But um, Kind of, you know, understanding what twelve hundred dollars means to yeah. folks in different situations. I think you're right that it feels like, you know, for some of us, um, it may not be all that noticeable, and for others, it, it it it's badly needed and doesn't and doesn't go far enough. I, I again, you know, I, I wonder about what sort of lasting uh, policies might come out uh, of the crisis. I mean, I think that there has been some discussion of. Um, you know, the notion that we should, that the federal government should enhance unemployment support, you know, which I think, I mean, that's $600 enhancement there, I think actually is. That's more significant. That's a considerable yeah. amount of money. Yeah. Um, and, and extensions on, you know, the number of weeks that you can, that you can receive. There has been some discussion of saying, you know, when the unemployment rate reaches 10% or 12%, these enhancements automatically, you know, should kick in. And to sort of take that out of, um, you know, political bargaining every time and to sort of build in, uh, uh, you know, a richer set of kind of automatic stabilizers um, would make some sense. I think that, you know, and, and again, to the, uh, you know, there's also been, been money provided to firms to, to encourage them to keep workers on the payroll. Um, and I think that's a useful thing, um, at least in principle as well. Yeah. It seemed like we should have started with that. So, uh, I mean, I know 
I've, I've read, I'm sure you have too, that that kind of practice was much more widespread in Europe where the government just right. guaranteed a large amount of payroll. And so companies didn't fire people the way they did here. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for, for that approach, both sort of in that it creates stability for the individuals, yeah. but it also, you know, it maintains existing business relationships. I mean, one, you know, one thing that um, kind of is, is a sort of hard to measure cost of this sort of disruption is, you know, you lose employees, um, you lose um, contractual relationships, you lose sort of uh, experience and knowledge that you've built up with specific other individuals or specific other companies um, that that kind of help um, help you to be productive and help the economy to run smoothly. And so, not just sort of uh, for the purpose of maintaining the stability of the income, but maintaining the stability of the relationship. I think there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah, I mean, it costs a lot of time and money to hire a bunch of new employees. Yeah, yeah, and and there's you know there's always sort of knowledge. Um, that they um, that they've gained, you know, obviously experience that they've gained over time. That you know, you've got to sort of start from scratch with new folks. So, I, I think there was some thought that that twelve hundred dollars was supposed to, go, you know, stimulate the economy because people were going to spend it on stuff they otherwise would not spend it on. You know, that n- now they can buy stuff whereas before they would not have bought stuff. And yeah. I, and and of course, everyone's going to not not everyone's going to partake in that, you know, I got one and I just stuck it in the bank and then I didn't end up buying anything I wouldn't have bought otherwise. So I'm not sure how much good, good that did for the economy. Yeah, I, I mean, I was sort of puzzled. Amy, wait, wait, you didn't spend your money, Amy? I spent why, money. Why do, you ha- why do you hate our freedom? <laughs> okay, go on, sorry. <laughs> I, I've, I sort of, in this instance, again, I think part of the uniqueness of this situation was that I didn't really see it um, as uh, so so um, strongly an issue of sort of trying to stimulate demand. Because at least in the, those initial weeks, we didn't want to stimulate all that much demand. Like we didn't, you know, I, I suppose whatever you could, you could buy online or through curbside pickup, that's fine. But we sort of didn't want to encourage people to go to the mall or whatever, right? I mean, right. and we didn't want to encourage people to go to restaurants. Uh, and, 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 and sort of dine in. Um, and so I sort of saw that as, as more uh, about paying the rent and paying the, uh, paying the utilities, which is, it kind of comes back to, again, I think next to the point that you made earlier that, you know, for, for, for those of us who have uh, more in the bank and, and had ongoing employment, you know, it wasn't really needed for that purpose. Um, so you know, arguably it could have been, um, could have been better targeted. I think there's always a bit of a trade-off between something is going to have more political support if it's right. widely distributed. Yeah, yeah. Um, whereas it might be more effective and efficient if it's means tested, but uh, it's harder to gain the political support for. Yeah, that just occurred to me that given with this government, that was the best possible. Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, I don't know about you. I, in addition to my check, I, after I got my check, I got another, I got another letter from the president uh, reminding me that I got a check. I yes. <laughs> so yeah, I um, saw that. <laughs> it seems like they did want to get the message out. Yeah. About that. yeah, yeah. And I'm sure you saw the news stories that the checks were delayed a couple of days to ensure that the president's signature would be on the checks. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. It didn't seem, uh, as efficient as it could have been. I uh, I come at this from sort of a big picture and historical um, sort of perspective, but um, I, you know these are we're living in uh, very uh, historically significant times yeah. in so many ways. So since that's your perspective, uh, I want to ask you about it. How uh, do you see any parallels between? our current economic woes and the Great Depression, uh, since we probably won't have a war, uh, I'm counting on not having a war that requires total mobilization. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, be careful what you wish for. Um, you know, I've, it feels very different to me in a lot of ways. I mean, um, there's a big literature on the Great Depression right. about sort of trying to understand the causes of the Great Depression. Right. Uh, Um, And there's still sort of, um, you know, ongoing debate about that, about 
And there was sort of a, you know, you can point to, uh, you know, at least half a dozen sort of big forces in, in the economy that sort of came together at that time. But, but, you know, it's not like everybody's in agreement, well, this is, this is what caused the slowdown. Um, they, they emphasize different things. You know, again, in this case, when we know exactly um, what caused the economic contraction in that sense, right. of course, it feels very different. And so at least initially, I was, I was, you know, just kind of as a layperson, pretty optimistic that ultimately the recovery would be, um, would be rapid, you know, sort right. of a V-shaped recovery, as they say, um, because, you know, we'd come to a point where we knew that the, um, the, the main trouble was behind us and that would generate a ton of exuberance. And, uh, and we'd all go out and spend that $1,200 that we put in the bank and uh, everything would be great. But, um, you know, the, sort of the longer this goes on, um, the wider the economic impacts spread, the more disruption to economic relationships there is. And I think also just, you know, my sort of epidemiological sense of it was, was you know, childish or childlike or terribly naive in the sense that I thought, you know, well, we'll get, you know, we'll have this vaccine and that's it. Then, that, you know, on, on Wednesday, you know, November 20th, this will all be done and everybody will know it. Um, and obviously it's not going to work that way. And, and, and um, you know, the psychological uh, dimensions of uh, that, I think, are going to be important. I think, you know, my view of what brings us out of the depression um, is, you know, is the war and the spending associated with the war but also sort of the, the confidence that that creates that, <clears throat> that the government can take on big challenges and defeat them, right? And so the, the psychological dimensions uh, of the recovery are really important. Right. And I've become concerned that um, sort of the, that, that aspect of this is getting uh, more and more challenging. And some standing that the United States took on as a superpower during that time and a lot of respect yeah. Our- yeah, it was really a, uh, a watershed. Mo- well, I mean, it goes without saying, it was a watershed moment, you know, in all those dimensions. Yeah. How did that, our superpower, this, because we were expanding trade significantly? Is that? Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, so you look at that period, and this kind of relates back to the debt question, actually. I mean, yeah. you know, we come out of the war, again, with um, a debt to GDP ratio of about 125%. Right. Um, but again, you know, think about how that was part of how that was accomplished, you know, buy war bonds and these would be assets, you know, for your family and your children down the line, which, which they were. But anyway, we, so we had this, this large amount of debt, uh, the war ends, um, people come home, people are um, optimistic. Um, right. The government continues to invest in the economy. I mean, the GI Bill, uh, you know, again, sort of thinking about the way crises shape, um, shape our economic policy. I mean, there's an argument that says, Part of the reason we don't have kind of a universal safety net, as you find in many European countries, is that we had the GI Bill, which, you know, at the time reached almost every, well, at least I, I guess I should rein that in a little bit, but at least among um, sort of white households, right. you know, reached a very large share of the population. But so, how could that have been when only, uh, only 30, uh, well, I guess then, under under thirty percent of the population was college educated. Well, the GI Bill I kind of broadly uh, conceived. So some of this is going to be. I mean, it's going to facilitate the growth in that in that education. Right. It's right. going to persist. You know, my, you know, my dad served in Korea and then after he got back uh, went to college on the GI Bill. And there's also going to be uh, you know mortgage lending support and and all kinds of things. Um, made available to veterans and the household of veterans um, that um, that's going to, the point is that that's going to reach a, a huge share of the population through, through this variety of avenues. Um, and so there's sort of, the argument is there's less, uh, less pressing for uh, some other kind of truly general um, income support or uh, uh, safety net kind of um, policy. So, so to kind of return to the original point, I mean, you come out of the war, People are exuberant. The government is still supporting um, supporting households in a new way, um, and you know the manufacturing infrastructure of Europe has been devastated. Right. And so um, the U.S. is going to be in a in a privileged position there. Um, and so that you know that period from 1945 to 1975 becomes you know the, the sort of golden era 
in which you had rising incomes, um, diminishing inequality, rising incomes on the bottom. Strong unions um, too. Strong unions, very high top marginal tax rates, right. generally much higher than we have now. Um, and again, at least initially a high level, <coughs> excuse me, a high level of debt. And, and so, you know, some folks will say, you know, you can have growth, rising productivity, diminishing inequality in the context of um, vigorous taxation um, and even high levels of debt. Um, and this era sort of proves it, although it was a, a unique era in so many ways. So, You were going to say something, Amy? Oh, no, just I was just adding stuff to the pile of nice things we did during that time, yeah. such as investing in education. Yeah, yeah. Um, investing in education, expanding, you know, you think about, I mean, think about what um, public higher education, um, you know, generally cost, and in particularly, you know, the California example. Yeah. Um, and, and the degree to which those things have changed is really quite dramatic. I two comments. One, I love to tell people that when I matriculated at UC Berkeley in 1984, my tuition was uh, about $1,400 a year. Wow. And six years later, when I matriculated at UCLA in grad school, then it was about uh, uh, $2,000 a year. Wow. The other, I was, my father also served during the Korea era, although they didn't bother sending him overseas and because mm -hmm. of it when he was in grad school he could afford a maid <laughs> <laughs> wow that was a different time yes <laughs> yeah a, a kinder more gentler time when grad students had maids yeah no I'm, it's it's i have been uh you know as i mentioned my my kid uh i think i mentioned my i have a, a daughter who's yeah. going to start college in the fall yeah. So this has been tremendously eye-opening for me. I was always a bit of a, <clears throat> a bit of a skeptic about, you know, how how bad has it gotten with regard to college costs? And yeah. it's it's something. It's really something. Yeah. So um, still what's, worth investing in. But what's um, tuition in Ohio? Geez, um, for out-of-state students, yeah, I feel like kind of the annual out-of-pocket cost would be, you know, forty thousand or something like that. Um, Holy fucking, something, holy fucking shit. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, I think that's about right. And she, you know, I'm proud to say that she got a lot of uh, merit aid. So um, we're not paying that, uh, but not paying all of it. <laughs> so, but um, it's sort of something like that. I mean, if you, you know, we went to, to uh, look at the Colorado schools and all these places. And it seemed like everywhere you went, sort of out of state, flagship public universities were going to run you. Fifty thousand dollars a year once you edit everything up, which is crazy. Yeah. Oh, totally. But no, you know, it's sticker price. I mean, not hardly anyone pays sticker price, but nonetheless, Utah is less expensive, as you know. Yeah. Do you have any other questions for Tom? Maybe. No. Nope. This has been interesting. Yeah, I've learned so much. Yeah. yeah thanks for having me. I hope that was of some. I hope there's something in there. It, yeah. uh, is of some value and uh, I enjoyed uh, it. Yeah, just talking through it with you. Okay, we will let you know when it when it's been posted. Great, I appreciate that. All right, well, thank you, Tom. We appreciate it. You have a good day. Yeah, you guys take care. Okay, stay safe. Don't get sick. <laughs> we'll do our best. Bye bye. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening, listening to, to the Professor, Professor and the Idiot. Idiot. If, if you, you like, like what you heard, go to Apple Podcasts, Podcasts and give us a good, good rating. rating. Your positive feedback completes us.